with it being 6 after 6 this evening, Tuesday, February 25th, I call the Francis House School District Board of Education meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. to approve the agenda as submitted. Second. Motion made by Mr. Lang, seconded by Mrs. Lang. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries 6-1. All right, board next on our agenda for this evening is a discussion on the legal services contract. Dr. Hendricks Harris, did you want to kick that off? You want us to kick that off? Dr. Hoban, over to you. Thank you. What I have to kick it off for tonight is I know uh, last week this was on the agenda. I apologize, I wasn't able to be at the meeting. Um, and the, the memo itself did speak to some of the highlights. It uh, referred to some of the uh, key points of some of the different law firms that were considered as part of this, as well as the uh, prices for each of them. And so what I want to do tonight is just give a little more detail to that highlight uh, as we look through the different law firms, what uh, stood out and, and led us to recommend Ed Council as our uh, recommended law firm. Um, one, of, one of the key points that, that wasn't in that information is that Ed Council, there are 518 school districts in Missouri and Ed Council represents just under 240 of them. And so it, it's a law firm that works with right at about 45% of the districts in Missouri. Um, and so we feel that that's a key point that not that too, too many law firms can speak to in terms of uh, the range of uh, topics they are involved in, the keeping their finger on the pulse of the things going on at all different parts of the state. So this is a law firm that's very, uh, very active in all regions of the state. Um, as, as we look at it, and some of the key points I'll talk about tonight would be true of other law firms as well, uh, but in terms of, of the totality, the, this is what led us to the Ed Council recommendation. As, as we considered them, um, among other choices, uh, they did come out to have a cheaper uh, proposal than one of the other strong choices. Uh, when we look at the monthly retainer rate, we know that right now we average about 25 billable hours a month. And so the retainer option is right about the same cost in terms of what we would spend per hour versus in a retainer right now. What the retainer option does is gives us the freedom uh, to not have to hesitate. If you have something small, uh, we know that you can pick up the phone and, and call the attorneys and get their advice as opposed to if, if you're paying per phone call, it, it causes you to really have to hesitate every time you um, uh, have, have a question. And so in terms of the different monthly retainer rates, uh, looking at Ed Council and, and also considering the Micus Law Firm, Ed Council was cheaper on their monthly rate there. Um, when we look at uh, Ed Council specifically, they, they focus solely on education law, and so they're able to devote all of their energy towards education and um, changes in the law and, and uh, current topics impacting schools. Uh, not only true of Ed Council, but Ed Council does have multiple attorneys for us to work with. One of the things that appeals to us, and this is true of some other firms as well, it gives us access to specialists in different areas. And so if you have an issue uh, in personnel, there's one person that, that really focuses and be, is an expert to turn you on, on personnel. If you have a, an issue with contract law, there's going to be a specific person to work with and so on. Uh, we, we think that that broad approach is, is certainly desirable. Uh, two other St. Charles County districts work with Ed Council, and both of those districts report uh, extreme happiness with that partnership. Uh, Winsville currently uses them and, and is very positive and tends to continue that relationship uh, into the future. Uh, Orchard Farm uh, uses them along with another law firm and only intends to expand their use of, of using it counsel. Uh, as I spoke to earlier with them representing so many districts around the state, I think it, it brings a global perspective on all the different issues that are impacting schools big and small in all regions of the state. Uh, that also allows them, that along with their focus on just education law, 
they're very active in state organizations at conferences and workshops. And so at most conferences, you'll see them presenting and not just presenting. Typically, they stick around at the conferences and even attend sessions so that they're staying current on, on the topics of education that, that impact us. Um, and, and again, another topic, they're not the only ones uh, who, who um, perform their services this way, but another key point uh, that I feel is important to us is, is when they provide advice, uh, and I can speak from this from experience and having worked with them in the past, when they provide advice, they provide you a range of options. Here's what we consider to be the lowest risk option. Here's another alternative that might have a little risk to it, but it's an option, and so on. And then as a district, they give you the opportunity to decide which of those levels you're most comfortable with. And then their role as the attorneys would say, now we'll defend whatever it is you chose to do. So we present you with the range of options, and then we're ready to support you as a district. So the ultimate choice in how to proceed is always lies with the district. Uh, speaking of Ed Council, I know that uh, one issue that I, I feel needs to be called out specifically to talk about is their handling of... Uh, Bill 1413 and um, some very public information that's out there regarding their relationship with the Columbia School District. And so uh, in, in speaking to that issue, what, what I would start with is what I just mentioned. Uh, they offer a range of advice and then it's up to a district to decide which option they would like to choose given the range of advice and then uh, a council would step in and support whatever the district chooses to do. Uh, if you look on their website, you can see they have a written opinion on the implications of 1413 and the injunction that was placed on it. In reading that opinion, uh, it is very, uh, really right in line with the opinion that our current council had given us. It's also right in line with the opinion that the MSBA attorney, Susan Goldlammer, has presented at conferences and workshops. And, and really, in essence, the, the opinion was, was two choices. Um, that on a, a ground level legal uh, opinion, um, the injunction only applies to the districts who are party to the suit. And so one option as a district is to say, well, we're not one of those two districts, and therefore that injunction doesn't apply to us. The other option was to say that as a district, um, we're going to honor that injunction and say, well, if that's the way the injunction plays out, most likely we as a district would end up in the same boat if, if, if we chose to fight it. So you have the option to uphold the law or honor that injunction. And so that's that's the written advice um, that Ed Council has on their website. It's also the advice we receive from our attorney, and it's also the advice MSBA provides. Uh, for us, as a district leadership team, as we talk through those options, we chose to honor that injunction. And uh, whether it was Ed Council, whether it's our current um, attorneys, whether we work through MSBA, we would have that same conversation and end in that same place. So uh, we felt strongly um, that that was the right call for our district and our community was, was to honor that injunction and, and work uh, with our unions as opposed to um, being adversarial on that situation. Um, so the difference in, in Columbia is um, Ed Council was their public spokesperson for that. That district chose the other side of the, of the options and then as their attorneys at Council was in a vote of, of supporting that um, situation. Uh, going back to earlier, knowing that they represent almost 240 districts, that is the only one to our knowledge that that, that has been how it played out. They have many other districts with relationships with NEA that are that didn't pursue that that option. Um, many others that have a good relationships with their with their unions and and fourteen thirteen has not provided any has not created any concerns. And so um, how we see that impacting us is again back to that. Um, key point that the ultimate decision on which option to pursue lies with us. And, and so we would take on any given topic, um, you can uh, Google most attorneys and find some case on some topic that, that you may find controversial depending on what it is. Um, they've all been party to lawsuits in different ways with different districts. And uh, we feel it's up to us to say thank you for the advice. We um, will try to make the most responsible decision for our relationships and for our district. And, and that is how we would choose to continue regardless of who our legal counsel is. So that's my summary. Um, other questions you'd like us to speak to? Mr. Lane. Okay, uh, you may answer some of what I have here, but I put some stuff down on, on paper. Um, thanks for having this meeting. Uh, over the past weekend, I was at home reflected over our board meeting from last Thursday. 
and thought about the hiring of a new law firm. And I thought that because I voted in favor of hiring the new law firm um, without doing due diligence and checking into it and you know looking at some options. I think that the hiring of a new law firm is kind of a big deal, obviously, because it it not only represents the school district, but the uh, board members as well. So if we're served with a lawsuit or something, that's who's gonna represent us. So sitting at home, I looked up and just did a Google search. You know, I didn't know nothing besides the name. You know, I had a hectic week and, and didn't have time with the board docs being released late. Um, we got it, you know, normally over the weekend prior to is when I would look over stuff. Um, I just found some stuff that was set off some signals and I asked around, did anybody else hear this, did anybody else hear this? Um, stuff that I don't agree with, obviously, the clarification is, is why we're sitting here tonight. Um, I just, you know, I, I think it's more of a question and answer now is what we should have done then. So, that's my opinion on it, just trying to see how we got to this point to where we chose them over the other ones and sure. And, and I would add to that, um, as you pointed out, we know that that as much as we make a recommendation for a law firm, it is a law firm that, that we need the board to also be comfortable with. And so uh, we understand that while we might do most of the day-to-day -day interaction with the law firm, um, there is that potential that as a board, A, you may interact with them if, if there were something later on, and, and B, you certainly have to be able to trust the advice that they bring forward. Um, in, in terms of the Google search and all of that, uh, the only thing to my knowledge that would come up uh, of concern there would be the Columbia School District, which is why I called that one out specifically to speak to. Um, their, their advice with every other district, to my knowledge that I've seen that they've worked with, has, has been the other side of that, which is to honor the injunction and, and to, not, uh, to not push the issue as they did in Columbia. So um, I firmly feel that, that as part of our recommendation was the understanding that the Columbia School District chose which side of that argument, and then as their legal counsel was up to, to Dwayne Martin and Ed Counsel to support the district's decision, as opposed to that that decision was Ed Counsel or Dwayne Martin's decision. Uh, much like with us, uh, the decision we've made currently, and then we expect our current um, legal counsel to support us in, in which way we chose. And, and again, we chose to honor, honor that injunction, and, and we would choose that again if, if the situation was in front of us again. Well, I was going to say also, uh, you know, I basically made my uh, vote off the recommendation without doing my due diligence, obviously. Um, and I just had a person forget what I was saying. Yeah. But okay, I'll pass it on. I'll remember. Um, can I get a little clarification on how the retainer actually works? And what I mean by that, so it's based on 30 hours. If we use 20, does it roll over? Just help me understand the retainer concept in this. I'm familiar with it outside of here. I just want to confirm my education. Uh, so for Ed Council, the retainer would work that we would pay the $5,400 per month, and that's irrespective of the number of hours we use from zero up to 30. So if we use 20 hours, it's $5,400, and next month would not be 40 hours, it would just be 30 hours. Uh, now, if we, in a particular month we use more than 30 hours, we would be billed at the regular hourly rate of $180 an hour for anything over the 30. So $5,400 is a set fee for up to 30 hours, no discount for less than 30 hours. Anything above 30 hours would be paid at the standard hourly rate. And was that typical for all of the law firms that answer the RFP, or is it a variety? The, uh, the other firm that uh, proposed a specific uh, retainer uh, relationship was uh, Megas O'Toole, and uh, they were $6,000 a month for 30 hours. Um, they didn't uh, have a, they didn't call out specifically what would happen above 30 hours, but I would imagine that it would be uh, pretty much uh, the same, that we would be billed at some hourly rate for anything above the, re the number of retained hours. Okay, great, thank you. Board, any other questions for Ms. Siglich? I have one. Um, so I'm assuming then, when you're talking about that retainer that we talked about before, the, the 
what did you say, $4,500, that's per month, that has got nothing to do with how many times we call them or something, whereas now are we being charged per phone call? Is that how that's working or was that, because I guess I'm confused because on that proposal then it said after it, a certain amount, that we would be charged the billable hours. I don't know what it is. I want to figure out, I'm trying to figure out what sure. it is. So, it, um, I, will, I can tell you what the experience has been with our current law firm. So, we get a bill and it lists out every day, essentially, every working day of the month, and, and there's an explanation of the work that was done on that day. So, uh, Mary Hendricks Harris called to ask advice about how to proceed with a Title IX case. Mark Delaney talked to me about an employee dismissal issue. Uh, Jennifer Patterson called to talk about a homeless case. And then there'll be a number of hours that were used that day, and what that would be, you know, by the hourly rate, and that's what we're billed. So, yes, I, I would say that yes, we're billed for every phone call, um, but that's, we're not, we're not billed in six minute increments. Some law firms bill every six minutes. So if I pick up the phone and uh, you, 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 know, you get busy, say, oh my gosh, the superintendent just walked in, I have to call you back, you're gonna pay for six minutes. I don't think that's the way our current law firm works. I don't anticipate that that's what a council would be. But for any substantive work that they do around a particular topic, we would be billed for the time that they put into that. And a lot, in fairness, a lot of our contact with our law firm is telephonic. Can I just, which brings me to my next, are we concerned at all that they don't have a, I know that they have like a satellite office in Lake St. Louis somewhere, are we concerned at all that their main office is in Columbia? Does that, is that a concerning to you, Dr. Hoban, at all? It, not a bit. Um, our experience, when I worked in Winfield and we had a relationship with them, they didn't even have an office in St. Louis at all. Uh, as Kevin just pointed out, the vast majority of the contact is over the telephone or email. Uh, what my experience had been, if we ever needed them in person, it happened as quickly as it could get here. And so, um, whether it was at a board meeting, whether it was at an event, whether it was providing training to our staff, never had any concern that when we need them in person, they were able to do that. That will only be easier now with someone constantly in that in that office in Lake St. Louis. Thank you. And I also want to say thank you for coming in and having us tonight because I had some definite concerns about that. Thank you no very, problem. very much. Mr. Lang? Kevin, I want to go back to the Mary makes a seven minute phone call. Are we charged for an hour? No. Okay. No. And then who has access to the lawyer? Is, is it, I mean, basically, is it control? Mary and I can't call tonight because... Currently, because we do a retainer, it's pretty open. So I think that all the chiefs are aware of legal calls that are being made, but we do not restrict access, um, especially from our director. So Dr. Patterson, as you can imagine, has access to, to our current law firm at any given time. But Patrick Lane, principal of ABC School, cannot call the lawyer. He would go through... Anything that goes to that, to that level, we would want to know about. So that's really not about controlling the attorney, in my opinion. That is controlling the level of incidents that our, our buildings are dealing with. So. Exactly. But I would also say I don't think currently our principals would actively call the attorneys, um, at least not without getting our permission to call them first currently. I, I think that's also something we could monitor, and if it became an issue and we had to get tighter with our control, we certainly could. Under our current structure, at, tw at 25 hours, roughly every month, that doesn't seem to be an issue for us, and I don't anticipate that changing. Thank you. And this isn't speaking directly to any of the law firms, but the retainer option has many advantages, and kind of you're hitting on the biggest one, in that we people feel more free, because we know we have up to 30 hours to confirm what they're believing, which puts us in better legal uh, standing, or to ask questions, uh, when they may or may not, if they know they're going to be on the clock every minute, and we might be being charged by the hour. So I, I like the retainer option for the way we, we have structured our legal advice. Thank you. Mrs. Lane? If you, I know Kevin, were you going to jump in with something, Kevin? I was
just say that uh, I've had this conversation with Dr. Hogan and Dr. Hendricks Harris. We are advantaged in Francis Howell by having a number of veteran administrators who have a great deal of expertise in their particular subject area. So Dr. Vanderpool has a good understanding of special education law. He certainly isn't calling the attorney every time some IEP issue raises its, uh, its head. So uh, Dr. Patterson, similarly with uh, student services issues, is very familiar with law, has dealt with a lot of things. I review many, many contracts. Those never get sent to the attorney. So at some point in the future, when there's a change in staff, you may see a change in the number of billable hours just based on the level of comfort and expertise that people are gonna have. So we do have the advantage of some people who <coughs> you know, don't use the attorney maybe as much as another school district would. So um, I had that conversation. I just wanted to make sure the board understood that part of the reason our utilization is relatively low is because of the people that are currently in the roles who typically contact our attorney. Uh, I just want to say thank you. I know this was not on anyone's agenda for this evening by any means, but um, I appreciate all of the extra information because clearly there's been a lot of kind of questions, um, but I just really wanted to say thank you and also thank you for the you know clarification that hiring a firm that has been involved in it, you know, the Columbia lawsuit, et cetera, et cetera, does not mean our district is interested in going down those paths. So thank you. Yeah. Board, any other questions, concerns, conversation? Is there any? Yeah. I wrote this down so I wouldn't screw it up. I just want to say I fully support the recommendation of administration and that was reviewed by the superintendent, the deputy superintendent, the chief operating officer, and the director of student services. I have no additional comments as I would have made those prior to the vote last week on 220. Board, any other questions, comments? by Mrs. Walker, seconded by Mrs. Lang. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carrying 7-0. Thank you everyone for uh, entertaining and being transparent and open about the conversation. Appreciate it.